Well, as we celebrate the centenary of Uncle John's birth, we come to a topic that was so close to his heart, proclaiming the gospel of God through evangelism. And I take as my text 1 John 4 verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. As an evangelist, this verse hit me like a bombshell when I first read it in John's 1960s book on evangelism, Our Guilty Silence, because I saw how indispensable the local church is to evangelism. So many evangelists don't get that. Uh, it, it means the key question for an evangelist is not, do you love the gospel or do you love evangelism? Often the affirmation is absolutely yes. The key question is, do you love your local church? because the local church is utterly central to evangelism. So let's now pray as we uh, regather for the 5.30 service after a year of COVID closure, that we'll understand, organize, and express ourselves as a community of love. Let's pray. 1 John 4 verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Lord, it's a huge hypothesis, this if, it's such a huge thing in our individualistic culture as we're meaning to come back to church. Lord, please reveal to us, help us to think this through and to work out what it means to love one another and the impact that that has in terms of all of our lives and the lives of the surrounding area. Amen. I worked with Rupert Higgins twice in my life. Once when I was a church assistant at Christ Church Clifton, he'd been ordained and was on staff, and I was uh, 21, working for the church after I left uni. And then again here at All Souls, when we were both clergy from 2002 to 2005. Back at Christ Church Clifton, when I was 22 in Bristol, he made a passing comment to me, just seven words, but it was so significant. He said to me, Rico, you do realize Church life revolves around the tiny gestures. Now, John Stott understood that truth. In the 1950s, Clark Bedford was the organist here at All Souls. And uh, here's a lasting impression that Uncle John made on Clark. The incident happened on a Sunday evening after John had preached three times and had taken tea with some elderly parishioners. I mean, he must have been exhausted. And a long line of people stood waiting to shake hands with Uncle John. After some time, John saw a blind young man on the other side of the porch walking out of the exit, and John left the line of people and walked over to talk with him. It would have been the easiest thing to have ignored him, Clark said. It, it, it must have been a long day. I'm sure he was tired, but he cared about that man with the cane and took the effort to make him feel special that evening. And he just said, Clark said, what an example it was to me. It was just three minutes at the door of all souls, but it symbolized so much. But even three seconds can be transformational. I was down uh, on the staff rotor to visit Uncle John on the day that he died at the College of St. Barnabas in Lingfield. So, so I, look, it, just, it just happened to be me. We, we had a rotor to go and see him. I was down. And I got there about 10 a.m. And Francis Whitehead, his devoted secretary of nearly 60 years, was sitting in the room, as was his niece, Caroline. The doctors had told them he was dying, and we sat there for a couple of hours, and I remember reading through John 14. Uncle John barely acknowledged me, but that was not the case when one of the Filipino cleaners came in to say goodbye. When John saw who it was, with a monumental effort, and I can still see it in my mind's eye, he reached up, he, he took his hand, and he kissed it, out of, uh, 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 and then slumped back with the effort. Uh, and as I was leaving at lunchtime and John's inner circle began to arrive, I noted that none of them were given anywhere near that greeting that the young man was given. And as I shut my eyes, I can see John give everything he had to serve the person with the lowest status in the room. It was a three-second gesture, but I'll never forget it. Now, those gestures were a symbol of what John understood about the local church. In his book, The Living Church, he writes... God calls us to be a community of love, loving each other in the intimacy of his family, especially across the barriers of age and sex, race and rank, and loving the world in its alienation, hunger, poverty and pain. It's through the quality of our loving that God makes himself visible today. Uh, amazing lines from this book, The Living Church. 
So let's just see the steps to being this community of love in our passage, John 1, 4, verses 7 to 12. And I've leaned very heavily on Uncle John's commentary on uh, uh, the Johannine epistles as I've done this. So in uh, 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 his commentary, he says this, it's because God is love in himself, verses 8 and 16, has loved us in Christ, verse 10 and 11, and continues to love in and through us that we must love each other. So as we seek to be a community of love, let's ask three questions of these verses. What is the origin of love? That's verses 7 and 8. Where is the power of love? That's verses 9 and, 11, 9 and 10. And how is it demonstrated today? Verse 12. So first of all, what is the origin of love? What is the source? From whom does it derive? Verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. We're told here that God is love, verse 8. But what's interesting is that John, uh, the apostle, doesn't unfold or explore this truth. For, uh, for example, with an explanation of the reciprocal love in the Trinity. Now, instead, can you see that he's severely practical? For having affirmed that God is love, that affirmation then leads to an appeal for us to love one another. So there's no interest here in the mystical experiences of those who claim to have been, verse 7, born of God and who know God, unless that knowledge of the God of love issues in love for one another. So to claim to know God while we hate another person is simply a contradiction in terms. If we hate people, then our claim to know God because he is love is a lie. So John's concern here is not to convince us that God is love. It's rather to call us to love one another. So can you see Christians are people who claim to know God and have been born of God, and that leads to being, being put positively and negatively. Verse 7 Everyone who loves has been born of God, positively. Verse 8, negatively, whoever does not love uh, does not know God. Now, what we have to see here is that the love being spoken of is not the ordinary human love which binds together husband and wife, parent and child, brother and sister, friend and friend. That kind of ordinary love, of course, exists outside the community of Christ and far beyond those who've been born of God and know God, because God has made all human beings in his own image and given all human beings the capacity to love and to be loved in that ordinary human sense. And Jesus made that clear in the Sermon on the Mount. He said to his own followers, if you only love those who love you, you're no better than the people outside the kingdom. That kind of love is not restricted to those who are born of God and know God, verse 7, but the implication here is that there's another kind of love that is restricted to the Christian community. It's not ordinary human love, it's divine love. It's the love of God. It's the love that stoops and sacrifices and serves. It's the love that looks for no reward. It's the love, here's the issue. Are you ready for our enemies? In fact, the ancient world had to invent a word for this love because it had never seen it before. This love for the loveless, this love for enemies. The new word, of course, was agape. And it's only possible for those who've been born of God, verse 7, and know God to whom he has imparted some of his nature. And this love is the hallmark of genuine Christian men and women. It's a love that reaches out to the enemy. And if so-called Christians, uh, and you meet them and they don't show that love, such a person doesn't know God, however much they may claim to, however orthodox or religious they may claim to be, John says, if they don't love with the love of God, they don't know him. They're, they aren't authentically Christian. So where do we see that love, that love for enemies? Where do we find it expressed? Where is it modeled? And here's point two. Where is the power of love? Well, John the writer now moves from doctrine, God is love, to history, God has loved, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Can you see the words that are in verses 9 and 10? Verse 9, he sent his one and only son. Verse 10, he loved us and sent his son. So God has shown his love for us 
by sending his son. And can you see why God's son was sent at the end of verse 10? As an atoning sacrifice for our sins. When William Tyndall was translating the Bible into English for the first time, there was no English word that summed up the Hebrew and Greek idea contained in the verse. So he made one up. Atonement, it means to make at one, at one moment. And the Bible's view of the world is that all mankind, as a result of rebelling against God, is separated from God. We can no longer be in relationship with our Creator, so there is a distance. And it's a distance that would last forever, even after death. But verses 9 and 10, God sent His Son to make us at one with Him again, to put us in friendship with Him. And Jesus did this by end of verse 10, being an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And of course, this language of sacrifice comes from the Old Testament. Once a year on the day of Yom Kippur, the whole family would go to the temple and they would take with them a little unblemished lamb and the priest would symbolically lay all the sins of the household on that lamb's head and then it would be killed. And the message was clear. We, like every member of our family, deserve to die for our sin. But God has allowed this lamb, this innocent lamb, to die as a substitute in our place. So the lamb pays for my sin. And as John the Baptist saw Jesus at the start of John's gospel, he cries out, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the day of atonement in the Old Testament looked forward to Jesus. He was the ultimate sacrifice, paying in death and blood for our sin to make us at one with God and enabling us to live through him. Now, surely that is love defined, to give all you have, your own son, to give what is most needed, in our case, the gift of forgiveness. And can you see here that it's not just uh, 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 that, it's also undeserved, verse 10. Not that we loved God. No, we turned our back on him. We were his enemies. How many times have we done that during lockdown? But it's not just undeserved. It's also sacrificial. He sent his son to die, and it's effective. It works. It means that, verse 9, we might live through him, and it makes us God's children. Amazing. I mentioned Rupert Higgins, who worked here 20 years ago at the start of the sermon, and I'll always remember something he told us when he preached on this passage at a lunchtime service. So he said in that sermon, I'm adopted. I don't know who my biological parents are. Age one, I was in a children's home. I had no parents. Then a couple came along and they adopted me and I became their son. And that love changed who I was. It gave me a new name, a home, a family. And my parents poured their love into me for the rest of their lives. That love changed me. It changed everything for me. Well, God runs the greatest adoption agency in the universe and his love changes who we are. And it makes verse 11 possible. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, as we think of Uncle John's legacy, my application here is that you read his book, The Cross of Christ. He said of it, more of my own heart and mind went into it than into anything else I have written. (laughs) John believed that the cross transformed everything. It gives us a new worshiping relationship to God, a new balanced understanding of ourselves, a new incentive to give ourselves to, to in mission, a new love for our enemies, and new courage to face the perplexities of suffering. In February 2002, John was in India, and while seeking out the blue-throated kingfisher and dashing after it, he fell he- heavily on a polluted bank. He sustained a nasty cut on his leg, And at one point, with the infection swelling due to what might be a blood clot or a deep vein thrombosis, he thought he was going to die. So he began to speak to Corrie, his study assistant, about 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he then said, I have a prayer for you, Corrie. It's that you'll keep the cross at the center of your ministry to the very, very end. He then prayed, Keep Corrie faithful to the message of the cross. That was Uncle John. The cross was at the center. It enables us to love our enemies. 
But thirdly, today, how is God's love demonstrated? Verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now let me allow Uncle John to explain these words. And just in case you don't think they're special to me, um, here's a little bit book that I wrote, Honest Evangelism, and I quote John's book from the 60s, Our Guilty Silence, um, in this a book um, which I wrote in 2014 on sabbatical, uh, in a section on striving to reach out together to the lost, to do it as a church family. This is what John wrote that's in my book. The invisibility of God is a great problem. It was already a problem to God's people in the Old Testament days. Their pagan neighbors would taunt them saying, where now is your God? Their gods were visible and tangible, but Israel's God was neither. Today in our scientific culture, young people are taught not to believe in anything which is not open to empirical investigation. How then has God solved the problem of our own invisibility? The first answer, of course, is in Christ. Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. John 1 verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, has made him known. That's wonderful, people say, but it was 2,000 years ago. Is there no way by which the invisible God makes himself visible today? There is. We return to John, 1 John 4 verse 12, no one has ever seen God. It's precisely the same introductory statement. But instead of continuing with the reference to the, God, the Son of God, it continues, if we love one another, God dwells in us. In other words, the invisible God who once made himself visible in Christ now makes himself visible in Christians. If we love one another. It's a breathtaking claim. The local church cannot evangelize proclaiming the gospel of love if it's not itself a community of love. Do you know, when I first read those words, I knew that they'd always go in a summary on evangelism if I ever did one. Can you see in the start of that verse, we start with a hypothesis, if, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another. And can you see then the two monumental consequences that ensue if we do love one another? One, God lives in us. And two, his love is made complete in us. Uncle John writes of these words in his commentary, God's love, which originates in himself and was manifested in his son, is perpetuated in his people. So as we love one another, we not only reflect the love of God, we also bear witness to the world. And so the Christian fellowship is the vehicle of God's love. And it was these fellowships that turned the world of the early church upside down, in 125 AD, a non-Christian commentator at the time wrote these words. They walk in all humility and kindness and falsehood is not found among them. This is what he wrote of the early church. And they love one another. They despise not the widow and they grieve not the orphan. He that has distributes liberally to the one that does not have. If they see a stranger, they bring him in under their own roof and rejoice over him as if he were their own brother. For they call themselves brothers, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And when one of their poor passes away from the world and any one of them see him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. If they hear that any of their number is imprisoned or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it's possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is among them a man that is poor or needy or, 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 and they haven't an abundance of necessities, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. So we can't see God because God is spirit. But what we can see is the effect of God. And that changed, changed the ancient world. It turned it round, this love. We can't see the wind, but we can see what the wind can do. We can't see electricity, but we can see the effect of its pro or it produces. And the effect of God is love. It was the apologist Francis Schaeffer who said, the love of the local church is the ultimate apologetic for the gospel. And of course, it was the Lord himself who said, John 13, verse 35, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. It's such a challenge. People should look at a Christian fellowship and see the love of God within its members. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we cry out to the Spirit 
We certainly don't look within and try and dredge up love from somewhere in our hearts and somewhere deep down uh, uh, I, I've not scoured. No, the answer is to remind myself of my sin and inadequacy as I look within and then I look up to the cross, I seek God's forgiveness and I see what's being done for me at the cross and I'm filled with love and gratitude and then I pray, Lord, by your spirit, please pour your love for this person into my heart. You loved me when I was your enemy. Help me to love this person that, oh gosh, they feel like my enemy. I can only do it through you, Lord. And as we pray that prayer, we need to ask ourselves, how does God in his love view this person? How does that view compare with my view? And then we need to do two things. First, we need to seek to listen to them, to understand their point of view. If you read the two big biographies of Uncle John by Bishop Timothy Dudley Smith, that's his early life, and that's the second one. So the making of a leader in a global ministry You'll, you'll see how hard John worked on listening to people. He'd always say, what's their best argument? Uh, and then repeat it back, listening to people. And then we need to, having listened, we need to ask ourselves, what are the tiny gestures that enable me to show love to this person, even to an enemy? But it's not just personal. We need to look outward to our community. We need to ask as a church, how can the love of, uh, 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 of God affect the world around us? In his chapter on evangelism in uh, this book, The Living Church, uh, uh, written at the end of his life, 2007-2008, um, Uncle John calls churches to do a local community survey, asking questions like, what sort of people live in our area? What places of business are there? Where do the people live? What do they, where do they congregate for leisure? How has the community changed in the last 10 years? What other religious buildings are there? And then we look to serve. Indeed, the All Souls Clubhouse was there to serve the local community as John did that study. Let me conclude with this. My neighbor, Pat, died last month. She was 90. In fact, here is her funeral card. She had a fall and then she didn't recover. She was in good health, but with the fall, just didn't recover. Uh, though I asked her to carol services each year, she only came to All Souls once to hear about Tamar, which is our ministry to sex workers and trafficked women. In fact, in pairs, our women go out in pairs to the many brothels in the area to, to visit these sex workers. So do pray for them on Thursday nights as they go and take cake and try and teach, language, teach languages. Pat was so impressed by what Tamar did that she gave money to them. She also funded Aslan, our work amongst the homeless. She had Katie Huggins, the Aslan manager, to tea and gave money and clothes to that ministry. In fact, she was thrilled to help pay for some mobile phones that were given to homeless men who would not go into hostels or, or hotels during the pandemic, but we had to keep in touch with them. I talked about her support of Aslan and Tamar at her funeral. One of the last books she read was this book. She's just Alice, a little book written uh, uh, by a mum about uh, a six-year-old little girl who died of a long-term illness and whose funeral I took. I think it may well have been the only Christian book that Pat ever read, but there's no doubt in my mind that seeing the love and service of Tamar and Aslan in the local area enabled her to start hearing the gospel. So let me conclude. What is the origin of love? It's in God. And if we don't love, we don't know him. Where is the power of love? It's in the cross. And that's where we go to find the inspiration to love others, even our enemies. And thirdly, how is it demonstrated today as we love each other in the local church? Amazingly, if we do that, people can see something of the Lord. So what an inspiration and motivation to fully re-engage with church after lockdown. Let me close with this story. When I first arrived at All Souls back in 1995, I got to know a, a musician called Dr. Stuart Spencer. He was 39, but found he had leukemia and he was dying. A church couple who lived on New Cavendish Street, David and Mary Tatlow, cared for him and took him in. He lived with them. And I visited him regularly there and was asked to preach at his funeral. About a month before he died, he said, do you think it would be possible, Rico, for me to have a cup of tea with Uncle John? I said I'd ask, and, and I gave Uncle John his phone number. The next week when I went to see Stuart, I said, 
Did anything happen? Did he make contact? He said, you've got to be kidding. He asked me to lunch at his flat and then said, did I want to go to a film? So we went. Then we went for tea afterwards and then he took me out to supper. I got back exhausted. Rico, I had about nine hours with him. Stuart would have been thrilled to have had a half an hour cup of tea. But John, in the last month of that man's life, gave him so much more, such love. I can tell you it was pretty overwhelming to hear him tell that story. And of course, it's a love that comes from the cross and being in a church family together. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, people haven't seen God, but it's amazing they see him not just in the Lord Jesus, but as we love each other. So Lord, please, as lockdown ends, please help us to love one another. Help us to listen. Help us with the tiny gestures. Help us to keep going back to the cross. And Lord, by your spirit, help us to be those that love one another. Amen.